Who remembers the old musical South Pacific? Anyone? <laughs> a lot of you are saying, what are you talking about? There's a song in that movie called Happy Talk. And it says, there's words in that song that say this, you've got to have a dream. If you don't have a dream, how are you going to have a dream come true? You've got to have a dream. If you don't have a dream, how are you going to have a dream come true? Do you have a dream? Do you have a, a, a vision, a picture of something that you want to see happen in your life? Straight away I think of that famous speech, right? Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream. Last week I dared us to have faith. Today I want to dare you to dream. I want to dare you to dream and to dream big, to also be able to shout, I have a dream, like Martin Luther King. Because man, if you don't have a dream, how are you going to have a dream come true? If you don't have a dream, something that you're vision, you have a vision for, how are you going to experience the great privilege of having a dream come true? Scripture says this in the book of Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. In other words, if you don't have a dream, <laughs> you're going to die off. If you don't have a dream, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have something you're aiming for, you're going to just stop living. But if you'll dare to dream, if you'll dare to dream, friends, if you'll dare to have a vision for something great in this life, you'll live. You'll live. You won't just wither away. You will live. How life gets in the way of our dreams, right? How quickly we settle into a safe way of living. We get bogged down by the, the difficulties and realities of life. And, and soon we've kind of boxed ourselves into a dreamless existence. That's sad. That's sad. When we stop believing that dreams can come true, that's sad. We stop pursuing them and we begin to perish. We begin to fade away. We begin to just exist instead of living for something greater. I want to dare us today to begin to dream again, to dare to dream. Because you see, I believe God has a dream. I believe God has a dream for you and for me. God is a dreamer. God loves to plan great things and then execute them and orchestrate them to come true. I think God looks at you and he looks at me and he has a dream for our lives. He, he has a dream for us to be saved, of course, first and, and sanctified and made new in our lives. He has a dream for us to live victorious lives, lives that conquer over the evil of this world. He has a dream for us to use our gifts for his purposes in this world. He has a dream for us to be free of sin and full of his spirit, living, changing the world. What's your dream? You've got to have a dream. If you don't have a dream, how are you going to have a dream come true? And so, when you begin to dream, there are three things I think we need to keep in mind. I want to share them with you, and then I want to share a dream of mine with you today. But firstly, as we start to dream, I want to say this to you. Don't limit God. Don't think too small when you start to dream. Dare to dream big. So often we are content to dream small, and, and so we play it safe. We rather just play it safe. Rather safe than sorry. I remember there was a kid at school with me <laughs> whose motto in life was rather safe than sorry. I thought, you're 10 years old, man. That's the wrong dream for a 10-year-old. A 10-year-old should be dreaming big dreams. But even me, I wonder how much blessing I've robbed myself of because of small thinking. Here's a verse that every dreamer should know off by heart. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him, to God, who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Wow. God is able to do immeasurably more than you can ever dream. Doesn't that give you hope to dream big? Doesn't that give you hope to say, maybe my dreams are too small. Maybe I need to start thinking big. Never mind, rather safe than sorry. What about God can do immeasurably more? I read these words in a book the other day. They've stuck with me. The author said, We are not motivated to pray because our view of God is too small. We are praying for God to repair potholes. <laughs> we are praying for God to repair potholes when we need Him to move mountains. 
We pray for God to help us meet our budget when we should be praying for God to unleash a tidal wave of generosity that will advance the kingdom further and faster. We pray for God to give our leaders wisdom, but we don't pray for God to give our leaders a vision that is bigger and grander than our capacities. We keep asking God to help us achieve manageable goals. We need to be asking God to relocate mountains. I read that and I thought, he's right. I've been thinking too small. I've been saying, Lord, just get us by, you know. Are you there? Maybe praying for God just to, just to do enough. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. When you've got a God who can do immeasurably more than you can ever dream. Maybe today we need to stop praying for the minimum and pray for a bigger opportunity, a bigger capacity, a bigger vision. One of the great Old Testament prophets was Elisha. He was the one who followed Elijah. Elijah went up into heaven without dying and Elisha took over from him. And there's an event in Elisha's life that taught me as well to dream big. I want to read the whole thing. It's seven verses from uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. So the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, so one of the other prophets, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord but now his creditors come in to take my two boys as his slaves. That was a common practice in those days. If you didn't have any money, they could take your children. Elisha replied to her, Okay, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? She said, Your servant has nothing there at all, except a small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, Go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few. You see that? Don't ask for just a few. Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, Bring me another one. But he replied, There's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. And she went and told the man of God, Elisha, and he said, Well, now go and sell the oil and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what's left. The key phrase there is don't ask for just a few. Don't just go and get yourself just enough, all right? Don't limit God. Dream big. Ask for an abundance and expect an abundance, not just the minimum. Jesus said he came to give us life in abundance. Why are we praying so small? How sad when we limit God. You know, Shireen taught me this to some extent. I think I was always a small thinker. And I remember just after we qualified, uh, we both qualified around the same time, Shireen started looking for a job. And the first offer came in. And I said, take it, take it, take it, take it. It's a job offer, grab it. And Shireen said, no way, this is a terrible offer. I'm not going to just take this one. I'm going to wait because something better is coming. And I remember it sort of freaked me out. And I thought, but yeah, you have a job offer. So, you know, you don't get jobs easy these days. She said, no, this is not what I've worked for. God is going to give me something bigger. Be, you know, believe. I was like, okay. <laughs> yes, you're right. She dreamed bigger than me. I was thinking, ask God for just a few, just enough. And she was saying, like Elisha, no, no. No, no, there's more that God wants here. If we believe that God is able to do immeasurably more than we ever imagine. Are we stepping out in faith and believing that he will do great things? God wants to do something great through you. He has lives to change through you. Through you. There, there are people who only you can bless. If you will have a dream, if you will do the thing God is calling you to do, don't limit him. Dream big. Go for it. I will say, though, on the other side of the coin, that sometimes the smallest thing is powerful. I don't want to make us say, ah, oh, don't think small because nothing good is done there. No. Sometimes God does great things through the smallest acts. Sometimes just getting your family through the day is a miracle. <laughs> and sometimes you've got, to, you've got to say, well, that was huge. That was huge for us. God did great things, even though it seemed simple to the world. It was an extraordinary miracle. Sometimes just giving somebody a bowl of soup might change the course of their lives forever. And it was a small thing. So yes, we need to think big. But don't think God isn't going to work in the small things. He's the God of the small things for sure. But don't let that prevent you from thinking big. Place your faith in the limitless God and dream big. God will do great things when we avail ourselves for great things in faith. 
But secondly, I want to say this. Don't just sit around. Don't limit God and don't sit around. Don't expect God to do all the work to make your dream come true. You know, some people abuse that saying, let go and let God. And they say, okay, God will do it. And God's saying, no, take hold. Take hold of this thing and do it for me. I'll give you the strength. You've got to put the effort in, but I'll give you the strength. They say there are two types of people, dreamers and doers. Some people dream their life away and never do anything about it. In fact, uh, we watched a movie on Friday night called Soul. Soul. Have you watched that Disney movie about the jazz musician? And uh, he dreamed to make it big. And at one point, his mom says to him, you can't eat dreams for breakfast. You can't eat dreams for breakfast. You know, you've got to go out and work. You've got to go out and do it. William Barclay is one of the great Bible scholars. He wrote a whole bunch of great commentaries. And in one of them, he tells a story about a man who dreamed big but did nothing about it. Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Samuel Taylor Coleridge, rather. These words about Coleridge have stuck with me. Coleridge, he said, is the supreme tragedy of indiscipline. Never did so great a mind produce so little. It has been said of him, he lost himself in visions of work to be done that always remained to be done. Coleridge had every gift except one, the gift of sustained and concentrated efforts. In his head and in his mind, he had all kinds of books, but the books were never written because he would not face the discipline of sitting down to write them out. And then he said, yeah, no one ever reached any eminence and no one have, has ever maintained it without discipline. And so here was a man who dreamed, dreamed huge dreams, didn't limit God. But what did he do? He, he stopped there, and he didn't actually do anything. Instead of making it happen, he sat around and he waited, and he dreamed some more, and he ate dreams for breakfast, and he got nowhere. Are you a Coleridge type? Dreaming, 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 doing nothing? Probably the most famous statement that people think is in the Bible but isn't is the sentence, God helps those who help themselves not in the Bible. Everyone thinks it's a verse, but it's not. But the Bible says something very similar in Proverbs 12. It says, those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Proverbs 12, 11. Those who chase fantasies have no sense. So if you're eating dreams for breakfast and not working the land, you're going to get nowhere. Solomon also wrote this in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. You can talk about your dreams all you like, but if you sit around, it's pointless. So maybe the time has come for you to stop just talking and start fulfilling your dreams. Maybe it's time for you to stop fantasizing and start doing. Start that business. Stop talking about it. Start that business. Start your studies. Start that ministry. Make that phone call. Send that message. Send off that email. Whatever. Put down your cell phone for once. Quit looking at TikTok and Instagram and do something. Do something with your life. A dream is only going to become a dream come true if you put down your head and do the work. And so, yes, friends, don't limit God. But for crying out loud, don't sit around and expect God to do what you are called to do. Get to work and see how God makes your dream take shape. Thirdly, I want to say this. Don't get despondent. Don't get despondent. Martin Luther King, in that famous I Have a Dream speech, I never knew that speech. I just knew I have a dream. That was it. So I went and, and read it this week. And it was a fascinating speech. He was speaking to his brothers and sisters of color who were pretty much being trampled on in those days. And they were starting to get despondent. They were really trying to change the way things were working and it wasn't happening. They were trying to fight for their rights peacefully and they just felt like they were getting nowhere. So in his speech, he said these words. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair, I say to you, my friends. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. That was powerful to me. 
Even though we face the difficulties of today, I still have a dream, he said to them. I still have a dream. And of course, he died before he could actually see it come true. America now is a place where everybody has a place. Everybody. If King didn't keep dreaming, but got despondent and let his despondency knock his dream off, what a waste his life would have been. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair, he said. And I wonder if you need that word today. Maybe your dreams are slow in coming true. Maybe you've been dreaming and trying and it's just not happening for you. Maybe you're getting despondent and despairing, thinking God's not going to make this one come true. Let us not wallow. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair, I say to you today, my friends. Let us keep going, one day at a time. One day at a time in faith. One foot in front of the next. Let's keep on dreaming. In the book of Revelation, John has a vision of Jesus. And Jesus is speaking to the churches. And he says this to the one church. You have persevered. And have endured hardships for my name. And have not grown weary. Will that be true of you? When Jesus comes again? Will he say you didn't get weary and despondent? In the vision that I gave you, but you persevered and you kept going and you endured hardships. No dream that is worth pursuing will come easy. No dream that is worth giving your life to will just come. You're going to have moments where you think it's not worth it, but keep going. Don't quit when it gets tough. Persevere in the dreams God gave you and they will come to fruition. And so again, I say to you, you've got to have a dream. You've got to have a dream. How are you going to have a dream come true if you don't have a dream? Don't limit our God. Dream big. Dream big. Don't sit around. Do the work. Get your hands dirty. Don't get despondent. Keep on at it when it feels like it's not working. And God will be with you as you live out the dreams he gives you. Now, allow me to share my dream with you in light of all of this. I watched the General Assembly this, this week with joy. It was great to see all Nazarenes around the world gathering in Indianapolis. What a sight. Nazarenes everywhere, you know, worshipping together, dreaming together, planning together. Now, 1908 was, the, I think, the first General Assembly. No, it was the second General Assembly. <laughs> and here they are, having the, the General Assembly back then. A group of what? How many people are there? 100, 150, whatever. Now, this was, this next pick was... Indianapolis, that's a small section of the group that met together. Flags from all around the world. Thousands, thousands of people came to be part of the General Assembly. And the Church of the Nazarene from a hundred years ago is now the biggest holiness church in the world. 30,000 churches worldwide, 2 million plus members. I watched this and I thought about our little church here in <laughs> the corner of Boxburg made me think about what we're doing here. God began this new early service nine months ago. And you know what? As we go forward, I don't want to limit God here. I don't want to limit God as we plan and dream about this place. I dream about this place being full on a Sunday, opening these doors and having more seats there, like the glory days when that used to happen. I dream about buying this house next door. You see it's for sale? I'd love to buy this house as a church. We, we turn it into our offices. We, we build a nice chapel. We build a proper Sunday school room. How cool would that be? I dream about English and Afrikaans worshippers streaming in here, being saved and sanctified, going back into the world as Nazarenes, touching the lives of people. I see a big sign on the highway so that the thousands of people who drive past us here see something's happening here. I see... I see youth on a Friday night having a great time. I see a big Sunday school with its own building, maybe there, but also maybe there, that side. I see men's fellowship, ladies' fellowship, more worship teams, outreach ministries, missionaries and preachers being raised up here from this congregation. I see new pastors coming in, evangelists. I see God blessing this place. Can you see it? Is God too small to do such a work here? Let's not limit God and say, okay, we'll just, have, we'll just get by at 
this church. We'll just exist. We'll just keep on existing and not really make a dent. No, man. Can you see Parkland Village blessed by this church because of the way we care for the people in this community? Can you see people coming in that boom gate by the hundreds to come here on a Sunday? I don't want to limit God. I, I believe God will do great things here if we keep on at it. But you know what else? I don't want to sit around and expect him to just do it. I don't want to sit around and expect somebody else to do it. I'm going to do all I can to be God's hands and feet around here. Have you seen some of the things that have happened here in the last nine months? We've had people paint. It's been beautiful. The painting looks lovely. The inside and outside looks completely different. We fixed the roof. The roof was falling apart. And we've had people come and fix the roof. We put the signs up out front, so now people coming to the dump know there's something going on here. We fixed the lights in the hall. It looks lovely now. We've put in new sound and audiovisual equipment so that we can, you know, worship nicely. We've painted and tiled the offices. We've set up the alarm. The cry room is looking beautiful. We've begun tidying the kitchen cupboards and keeping the bathrooms nice and clean. And you know what? I haven't done it all. In fact, I've done very little of that work. But people around here have not sat around. And they've been part of all of this great stuff. More importantly, we've inducted new members. We've had a whole bunch of people find their home here. We've received new board members who made a great difference already. We've had baptisms, and I'd love to see more baptisms happening. We had a great carol service with 180 people. We had a great movie night just a few weeks ago with 80 people. We had a beautiful Holy Week, sunrise service in the cold. Uh, we had special visits from Dr. Thomas, Dr. Mellers. Do you remember them coming and preaching? We had a network course. We're going to do an alpha course in a little while. We've got four Bible studies. We've got Veritas training that Peter's doing, and it's going great. We've got Sunday school, teachers and kids. Love your neighbor was amazing. Everyone chipped in. It was great. We've got a prayer ministry, a care ministry, a flower ministry. We've got a worship ministry. We do ministry to the aged in plantation at a place called Cedar Manor. Whenever we've needed help, this congregation has stopped sitting around, or not sat around, shall I say, and chipped in. I love it. This is a church where people don't just sit around, but they do God's work. Will you join us in making this dream come true? Will you not just sit around, but do what you can, however you're able, using your gifts or your talents or your time or your treasure or whatever, to make the dream come true here. God's going to honor us if we're a church who doesn't just sit on a Sunday and talk the talk. But if we get up and we do it like we have been. And so let's not get despondent here at Church of the Nazarene, Boxburg. There are days, even like this morning, I thought, oh, the numbers are a bit low. Darn. I think, Lord, what's going on? We go there to pray and before the service... I think, am I going to pray, Lord, fill this church between now and when we walk out? <laughs> there are days when I do get a bit discouraged and I think, well, ah, it's coming. the dream is slow in coming true. There are months when we don't meet our monthly budget and I think, are we dreaming too big? There are days when tensions rise and difficulties get in the way and I think, is God going to actually do anything here? But oh, let us, not, let us not for a moment wallow in the valley of despair. Let this place be a place of joy and excitement. Because no troubles and no struggles can kill the dreams that God has for this place. You've got to have a dream. We've got to have a dream. If we don't have a dream, how are we going to have a dream come true? I dare you today. Dream big. Dream big in your own life and be part of our big dream for this church. You know what, friends? We don't have to be another mega church. There's already one down the road. We don't want to become Wurt and Lever. They're doing great things there. But we want to become a vibrant, passionate community, seeing people's lives change week after week. Join us. Join us as we do this. And I can't wait to see how God makes our dream come true. Let's pray. Oh Lord, you are the God of dreams, not only giving us actual dreams when we sleep and speaking to us there, 
but giving us visions and ideas and plans. We do have a dream, Lord, and in the, the nine months that we've been here, you've done amazing things. We thank you for the great works you've already done here. But Lord, we're not done dreaming, because we know you're not done dreaming for this place. We long to see great things happen here, moving forward. We long to see more and more people finding you here, Lord. And so we offer you our dreams today, and we ask you to help us help them come true. Lord, we commit to doing what we can to letting this dream come true. We commit to not sitting around, but to offering ourselves however we can, however we can. And we commit, O oh God, to not getting despondent. And on those days when we do get despondent, Lord, forgive us. Give us that big faith, that big faith that moves mountains. Lord, don't just, don't just help us to exist here. We don't want to just exist. We want to thrive we don't want to just get by. We want to be an abundant blessing to many others. Bless us to be a blessing. Bless us so that your kingdom can come to Park Rand, Sunwood Park, Liberdeen, Cinderella. Through us. Use us as you will. And so we offer ourselves up to you just as we sang just now. I will offer up my life. Take us, Lord, and use us so that this dream will come true. This is our prayer in the strong and mighty and immeasurably great name of Jesus.